There was a part of me that, um, that wanted to prove that a little girl could survive in the Alaska wilderness in the wintertime. Because I have, and I, even still, I have readers who will say, oh, it's so unbelievable. And I feel like, say, I've got chapters that prove it. She could do it. <laughs> But, but I did, and I have to say, with both my agent and my editor, another surprise that came along is I was never told to do anything. Instead, I think that what Jeff said was, have you thought about just taking those out, those chapters? What would it do to the story if you didn't have those chapters? And I thought, wow, it makes it a completely different book. Um, and I think it opens up that possibility for magic more, and try, instead of trying to explain it all away. So, and then my, what became my goal, instead of like um, feeling this little feisty little girl in me that wanted to prove that a girl could survive in the Alaska wilderness, instead my goal became to try to make both possibilities survive all the way through to the end of the book. So I wanted it to be both that she could be a magical being that came to them out of love and snow and ice, but also that she could be an abandoned little girl who, who could survive on her own. So I wanted both those possibilities. Now, granted, I think that some readers have found that frustrating, that in the end, I don't give a clear answer. And, and, and I don't know it. I don't know how to explain this, because I'll get emails or, from book clubs, questions, tell us what happened in the end. And I say, this is all I know, <laughs> what I have right here. And I love hearing different, um, and in ways I almost feel like it's like an ink blot test, the ending, because people share what they think happens in the end. And I think it says a lot about how you perceive the world. And I, there's not a right answer. I'm not sure who Faina really is and what happened to her in the end. This is the story I wanted to tell. And I am somebody who likes open endings, so that might not be good for everybody. I can contemplate what I think happened just like another reader can. But, but I don't know how to explain this, and I was talking to another author about this. There is no right or wrong answer except for what's here. I mean, this is what I know for sure. And if I tell you what I might think might have happened with Faina or what she might have been, you're, you might give more credence because I'm the author, but you shouldn't. Like, you know, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I don't want to take that away from anyone. I'm not sure how to explain it. Um, at times, I did tell book clubs a little more of what I thought or imagined, and then I realized I was ruining something for them. And so I've stopped doing that because I feel like, you know, it, it's a really interesting experience. Once it's like this, it's not my story anymore. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's the reader's story. And what you take away from it, that's what matters now at this point. And if I have, you know, miscommunicated something, that's, it, it, it's, it's, it's on its own now, basically. So I know that can be frustrating sometimes for people to hear. <laughs> I'm very careful to say I do not live in the bush. Um, bush Alaska is like you are off the road system. You are flying by plane or going by boat. And the, uh, a great amount of Alaska is Bush Alaska. And I feel like those are the true rugged Alaskans who are living that way. So, but we live, um, so the town that we live nearest to is called Palmer. And it's got a population of about 5,000. And that's where we go to like grocery shop and um, go to the post office. My daughters go to school there. My husband works there. And we live about 30 miles northeast of there. Um, and, the, and the area we live in, it's a dirt road. Um, we have neighbors, we can't see them from our yard, um, but we're a really close-knit community. We have gatherings, you know, anytime we can think of a reason, summer solstice, winter solstice, you know, um, we help support each other. So, you know, it's, it's a rural lifestyle in a lot of ways, but by Alaskan standards, you know, we're pretty fortunate. We can go in and watch an opera in Anchorage. We can drive here, drive there, um, and run down to the store. Now, it might take a half hour, but we can run down to the store. But we do try, I think a lot of Alaskans, you know, I think it's true of a lot of Americans, um, there's a certain desire for a little bit of self-sufficiency. So a lot of our neighbors are, you know, raising honeybees and chickens, um, butchering their own, we process all our own meat. Um, it's just kind of a feeling of that we can take care of ourselves. I think there's a little bit of pride in that. So it's very much a part of our lives, absolutely. If I had any um, trepidations about the book, it was the hunting and trapping part of it. Um, I, I felt like it's a part of my life that I learned when I went away to college to not share, to be honest, um, because it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I tend to lean more liberal in my politics in a lot of ways, and yet um, trapping and hunting is very much a part of my life, and it's not always um, welcomed in all rocks of life. And so I was really nervous about writing about it, and yet it, it's my life. It's what I know, and it's what's important to me. And it was interesting because, again, my agent um, had the, I feel like he had the, the knowledge to see that that was what I had that I could write about from my heart. And he actually told me, you need to put more of that in, write more about it. But the shooting of the fox, I mean, frankly, it's what a lot of boys that I knew growing up would have done. Um, so it's nothing, I mean, those of you who grew up on farms or grew up in rural areas with, with boys and girls who hunt, 
um, if you see a fox near a farm, you're going to shoot it. And now granted, he is breaking the very rule that Jack has set out for him, um, but I felt like that's part of growing up too, as you make mistakes, you break rules, maybe you regret it later. Um, so I felt like it was very much, and it was really interesting because my editor, um, although my agent uh, revised it a lot with me, um, my editor that I ended up having at Little Brown was really insightful, and she actually had me move that scene up in time. So originally I had that occurring when they were both younger children, um, you know, maybe like 12, 13 years old, um, uh, Garrett. Um, and she said, you know, I think you should move that up in time because I think it's an interesting concept that the fox maybe is in some way a guardian of Faina, and that then she becomes um, open to the idea of mortal love because she doesn't have her fox anymore. Now, that wasn't my train of thought, but I thought it was a really interesting idea. So I actually moved that up in time so that occurs when they're, when they're young adults. As I was writing the book, um, there was something in the news about a swan hunt in western Alaska. Um, uh, I think, if I'm, if I'm right, I think Alaska natives can hunt swans, but um, uh, other, other people can't. So it was some kind of subsistence hunt. And I remember feeling a little like, wow, really? You're going to kill a swan? And I mean, I've hunted a lot of different kinds of animals. I'm not someone who usually wants to romanticize an animal based on how it looks. Um, it's more like, can you eat it or not? It's more of a decision. Um, and so I, I, it was, I think oftentimes as writers, maybe we go to those places where there's a rub, where there's something we think, Ooh, why do we feel that way? And so that's kind of what grew out of that. But then when I wrote the scene of her killing the swan, my mom read it and she said, this is really interesting. You're really bringing up a lot of fairy tale images with this. And so then that's how it grew from there. And then I imagine her keeping this. The, it's funny how you don't always know out. And so I knew she kept the feathered skin, but I didn't know why until the wedding dress came, and then I knew that's why. Life is bittersweet. And I, and I can share this, you know, as I was writing the book, um, as I had come up with the idea, and I was pregnant with my second daughter, and um, a very dear friend of mine died of cancer, and she's the same age as me, and she had a little girl. And I actually delivered her eulogy in our small town as I was pregnant, I think I was six, seven months pregnant with my second daughter. And it was a really um, difficult and powerful moment for me, the sense that it, it's not fair what happens and, and who gets taken from us and how we cope with that. And so as I wrote The Snow Child, I mean, that was very much, I'm not saying that, that Faina did die or she did disappear into the snow or she left because, I, but, but part, of, what my, part of the story is, is that for Jack and Mabel, all they know is she is gone from their lives and they have to somehow find the bitter and the sweet in that. And so it is very much about what I wanted to, to, to express and figure out how, how do we cope with grief? How do we work through these things that seem unfair and, and hard? There's lots of books that I have read that have no plot, and I love them. No, I really do. But I think most people don't love plotless books. And so I, and I, and it just felt for me that there wasn't momentum. There wasn't a sense of where is this going. And, and I think sometimes now it's not even about plot as much as like, what do I want to say? What's the point of this? Why am I writing it? Why does someone want to read it? Um, but like I said, the characters have come in handy for me. When I've gotten some short story requests, I go visit them, um, Ernest and Mary, and uh, I like them very much. So um, yeah, but I don't think I'll ever, I'll ever go back to it. People want to know, okay, who's Esther, you know? And the truth is, I do have an Esther-like neighbor. Um, but I really, with her, I guess, I feel like I wanted to capture what I think is the, the strength and goodness of a lot of Alaska women. I think um, there's this feeling among a lot of Alaska women that they want to be self-sufficient. And there's such kindness, um, but kind of a rough and tumble kindness at times that I really admire about Alaska women. So she's sort of this conglomeration of a lot of women I've known and kind of a spirit of them. I, I think she's, like I said, I think she's a lifesaver and she's a survivor. I think that um, Alaska is a place, I mean, I think a lot of places are like, it's a place that you either love it or you hate it. And, and, and maybe you have to learn to love it, which is kind of the story that I wanted to tell of Mabel, is how did she learn to love this place? And I think Esther was one of the people that could kind of show her how it was done, because she just threw herself into it wholeheartedly. And that was an interesting part for me, because I, um, I love Alaska. I grew up there. Um, I've never wanted to live anywhere else. I've enjoyed traveling, and I'm desperate to get home at the end. And it was a really interesting, fun thing to imagine coming there as an adult for the first time and hating it and then trying to imagine how I could fall in love with it. And so that was sort of the path I wanted to follow with Mabel and see how that, and I think Esther was critical, really, and she saved my sanity at times, too. <laughs> Thank you so much for all turning out for this. It's, um, it's really phenomenal. Thank you.